Okay, so hello everybody and welcome to the latest in our Eurocham webinar series. Uh, so these are very challenging times for all businesses. And so although this webinar is actually the eighth in our series, it marks a shift away from our usual topics, which focus on business opportunities in relevant sectors. Our other webinars can still be found on our YouTube channel. Today, we'll be focusing on remote working software that may help businesses adapt to the challenges placed by the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, my name is Tom Hesketh, and I'm the Business Services Manager at Eurocham Cambodia. But for today, the remote working expertise will come from my co-presenter, David Benayim. So having been remote working for at least half a decade, uh, David is an expert in all things related to scheduling programs, meeting software, and Microsoft products. And we're excited to have him join today uh, to share some of his hints and tips. He's the founder of Cambodian-based and accounting, training, and IT firm, Excel Consulting. So to introduce the agenda today, today's webinar will last between 45 minutes and one hour, including Q&A. We'll start with a brief introduction to Eurogem activities during COVID-19, uh, which will last around five minutes, uh, before David launches into his demonstration on the software businesses can use to ease that transition into remote working. As the focus of today's webinar is remote working, we will not be addressing questions related to the response of the Royal Government to the COVID-19 outbreak. For these, please send Eurojam an email via our website if you want to find more information. However, we are happy to answer questions related to remote working. Uh, questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation and you can type them at any time into the chat box on the bottom right of your screens. Any questions we cannot answer due to time constraints will be subsequently answered via email. Uh, and this webinar will be published online on the Eurocham YouTube channel and for those registered you'll receive a link to the upload once the webinar is complete. So Eurocham, um, I'm sure most of you already know, but for, for those who don't, Eurocham is currently the largest non-Cambodian chamber in the country, and our activities are focused around four main pillars. The first of these is members, which includes the events and networking, uh, networking sessions most of you associate the chamber with. Uh, we have our outreach department, where we promote Cambodia to outside investors. Uh, we have our advocacy department, where we work with members and the royal government to try and improve the ease of doing business in the Kingdom of Cambodia. And finally, services, which is my own department, where we support companies and institutions enter, enhance, or expand their activities in Cambodia through paid advisory services. So like most organizations, however, our activities have had to change. Um, particularly, our events have been postponed until further notice. This includes our Eurocham AGM, and so the Eurocham board will be staying on until further notice. Um, and most of our staff are now working remotely. Uh, and so really our, our, our activities change towards more um, supporting our members and the wider community through the timely dissemination of relevant news and advice related to the COVID-19 outbreak. So this includes working with UNICEF to disseminate uh, EMA, Ministry of Health and WHO validated communications. Uh, it involves engaging with the government to discuss mitigating measures for impacted sectors, for example, tourism. Um, and in particular, it involves gathering and summarizing all relevant decisions made by the royal government. Um, so all of these activities can be found in our latest April 2020 newsletter. If this is not in your inboxes already, you can find it on this link and you can find it on our website as well. Um, so these include the translated summaries of some 28 announcements made between March 23rd and April 3rd, um, as the situation is continually developing, um, the Eurocham Advocacy Department will be continually updating this section with new announcements. So please uh, tune into our website to see those latest announcements. Our content also includes our rapid assessment of the impact of COVID-19 on Eurocham member businesses. Um, so this short survey, although small in sample, we have around 30 respondents for it, uh, provides at least an initial idea of the extent to which businesses will be affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, finally, we'll be continuing to produce webinar content, which we hope will be useful to our members. Uh, on Friday, the 10th of April, we're planning to launch a webinar on how to navigate legal risks during COVID-19. So we hope to see some of you who are registered here today uh, join that event. And so with that summary, 
Um, I'll now pass you on to the content you've joined for, and I'm pleased to hand over control to David Benayim to take us through the remote working software that can support organizations adapt to COVID-19. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let's get going. Bienvenue tout le monde à cette présentation qu'on va faire ensemble avec Eurocham. On va parler de la technologie avec laquelle on va travailler euh, pendant euh, le temps avec euh, le coronavirus. Cool, eh? Well, it doesn't get the proper nouns, right? But a lot of people don't realize the applications that you're already using have some hidden features that are really, really useful to be able to um, share this with people across the world, maybe who don't speak the same language. For example, in PowerPoint and Slideshow, you can choose subtitle settings, you can choose one of these as an input language, and you can choose the subtitle language in one of 60 languages here. So they are constantly adding to this list. Unfortunately, Kamai is not in the list yet, but hopefully it should be soon. So this feature exists in PowerPoint uh, desktop if you have the newest version and as well as some other ones. I'm going to switch that off and get into my intro. So my name is David Benayim. I have a YouTube channel under my name and I'm getting around 10,000 views per month at the moment. So I'm talking about a lot of things to do with, uh, with technology from Excel, PowerPoint, and also remote working applications as well. I became a Microsoft MVP last month, which means um, I'm considered to be amongst the top 100 Excel users in the world. Uh, and I even have first point of contact with the people on the Excel development team about how they can make their product going forward. And it's not just Excel, it's also PowerPoint, Microsoft Teams, and other applications as well. Uh, I'm also a chartered accountant who qualified in the UK. I've done corporate training with over 1,800 people, including a bunch of courses with Eurochamp. And I run a company that's done consulting with over 120 organizations here in Cambodia over seven years. There is a lot of software that are offering free versions during COVID-19 of their otherwise paid versions. So Office 365 is a big one, uh, Cisco WebEx, uh, Snagit and Camtasia, something that I'm actually using to record this presentation and some other ones over here as well, including Zoom that you may have heard of. So we're going to talk about six things. We're going to talk about video calling, then screenshotting, uh, something that I call channel-based chat, Netflix for meetings, Kanban boards like Trello that you may have heard of, and then we'll get to the finish line. So kick off with some video calling technology. <laughs> if you uh, find that familiar sometimes, can't say it's ever happened to me. Consumers tend to adapt technology much, much faster than organizations. So one such example is Skype. Skype is a software that was used a lot by consumers who decided it would be really useful to be able to phone the grandparents and show the children to them, or even just go on holidays and be able to call home and maybe video chat and see what's going on with people on the other side of the world. So consumers adopted that really fast. And eventually those consumers became employees and companies. And so they started using the same technology at the workplace. So Skype is a very common example. Another one is a chat app, for example, WhatsApp or Telegram or uh, Facebook Messenger. They are used more and more and more and more in the workplace. But the issue with these kind of applications is they're built for consumers. They're not built for businesses. It's not business tech, which means that your data, anything that you share, any file, any conversation, any video chat, that's all contained outside of your corporate infrastructure, which means that it's not searchable and it's kind of risky as well. So it's risky that it's, it's not, uh, it's not encrypted and it's not really stored in a place that could be, it could be found later on. 
Also, these applications don't tend to integrate very well with what you're used to using inside your organization. Uh, if you're already using, for example, Google Drive or Microsoft Office 365 to, to access your documents, then none of these applications really integrate very well to those because they're built for consumers. So we have this new generation of conference calling software that allows you a whole load of other methods. For example, you have a feature to, to make people wait in the lobby, which means you only admit them as they come in. People can join through a link rather than you have to wait till they're online and then say, well, I'll call you when you're ready. And a couple of other things as well. So the quality tends to be uh, vastly superior and the host has control of more things. So they can mute all participants, unmute, even mute people upon entry, which I highly recommend using in these kind of instances as well. So uh, let's look at Zoom, which is a very, very popular application during COVID-19. So um, if I open up a Zoom application here, this is the software, uh, which some of you may be familiar with already, but I'm gonna try and show you some features that you might not know exist. So here I've got my shared screen, and I'm gonna show you that I can start a video and believe it or not, I am not outside the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco <laughs> from where I'm joining, but you can choose these things called virtual backgrounds. And although I, when I first saw this, I thought it was kind of gimmicky, then I saw someone else do this and I think it's, it's quite a clever way to do it. You could essentially have your corporate logo behind you so people can just always see things about that. They could, for example, see maybe an email address here or a, um, a social media handle or something like that, your company and some other information about that. I think it's a really good way to showcase what you can do in your company. So uh, that's one of the features that I really like. I'm also going to, uh, I'm also going to do this thing called closed caption. So. This allows you to be able to assign someone else to type captions as you speak. So this is again really good for translation if you are working cross country. This has, is being done manually, but I'll show you how it works. So I can click on the more button there and I can say assign to type closed caption. Then I'm gonna show you that person who's assigned is in my browser view. And you can see here the host has assigned you to type closed caption. So. I can click on there and now I can type it. So uh, say what the person is speaking, enter. And then if I go back to my Zoom view, it says closed caption is available for everyone else. And he can see exactly that. I can even change my language setting to, for example, Kamai. And you can type in these different characters as well. And then again here, they can see the output of that. So this can be a really efficient way to have data that's being translated live. Imagine having a translator who is just typing uh, instead of speaking over people on the phone. That could be a really cool application use case for it. As I said, you have more control here. So you can click on the more button. Uh, you can make people a host and there are roles in these kind of meeting arrangements. Uh, you can ask them to start a video or you can also mute all or unmute all if you want. And you can also, as I said, have a setting that mutes them as they come into a meeting. People can join these sort of things from their mobile phone or from a web browser or from a desktop application. And there's some other features here. And I'm not going to go into all of these right now, but some of them are worth exploring um, if you are interested in that. So now here, going back into my slides, this is important actually, Zoom made some important updates on the 5th of April, so a couple of days ago. For example, they have now set on by default that every meeting requires passwords to sign in and automatically puts you in the waiting room. Now these are features that can be uh, disabled, but yeah, it's just something that's applicable. And actually this happened to me yesterday 
We were putting on a meeting that we'd scheduled last week, which was happening yesterday. And because it was after the 5th of April, it had some issues with that. Um, another thing is that now, as I'm experiencing it, you can't join a Zoom meeting without a Zoom account. So this is something that is uh, quite unexpected because all of the other applications do allow you to have that. So it kind of uh, strikes me as surprising that you need to sign in for that. So if you log into this website, zoom.us, with your Zoom credentials, you can go to settings and then you can find those settings down here in the list of things that you can turn on. So if you control F and search for password, there are this one that says require a password and a few other things that you should check whether to enable or disable as you go along there. So back into the slides. And here I am, I'm kind of looking at the top four players I believe on the market, which is Zoom, WebEx, Google Hangouts, Meet and Teams. And this is how I believe they fall. For example, like the call features, I believe that Zoom has the best one. But Microsoft Teams has the best stuff, kind of pre-call, post-call, and also a side chat. So I'll show you some of those at the moment here in Teams. So here I am in Microsoft Teams. This is their go-to meeting application uh, that is replacing Skype for Business. As you can see here, uh, there's someone that's waiting in the lobby. So I'm going to press that I want to admit them from the lobby. And that is just me on a private browser. So here I can see the participants, a lot like Zoom. You can sort of edit the things, you can send the link information that way. You don't have as much control, you can mute people that you can't, for example, unmute all or ask them to start their video or uh, do other things, etc. Uh, you can, though, do some other things. So I mentioned that you have a conversation, so side chats are available in all of them. But what you can do is you have a lot more flexibility. So if I have a picture, for example, so if I have a picture, for example, I can just paste it there. And then this can paste in an image which people can react to, a lot like you would get in social media that you might be expecting. Uh, you can also sort of reply to messages. You can save messages. You can edit things which you can't do in the other applications. So this is one benefit that I like about it. You also have a meeting notes built-in feature. So you can take some meeting notes about whatever it is you're talking about, and these get automatically uploaded into the meeting chat as well. So I can just sort of type it in here, and we'll see where that goes afterwards. So you do have also a video option. You can click here and you can have a camera over there. But you have this thing called blur backgrounds. So what blur backgrounds does is it looks at what's behind you and kind of uses AI to make that not really viewable. Uh, so it's much better, particularly if you have lots of interruptions going on behind you, I find it actually much slicker than the one that Zoom and the other apps have. So this is my regular background, and then this is my blurred background there. Uh, you can also have automatic subtitles or captions here. So a lot like I showed you for PowerPoint, although it doesn't translate them yet, but I'm sure that's coming. And you can see that it's doing a decent job. I can even talk really, really fast and see what it's doing and seeing if it's picking up my language. But if I use proper nouns like Phnom Penh or coronavirus, it probably won't pick that up. Let's try it. <laughs> All right, it's got coronavirus, but do you see how it managed to keep up with even me talking very, very fast? So that can be a really useful way to have people join in on the meeting, even if they're in a noisy environment or can't put on their headphones or things like that. So I'm going to switch those off, and I'm going to do this start recording thing. So start recording allows you to record everything that's happening on your screen. It says, let everyone know they're being recorded. Uh, obviously, they get that notification as well. And it records everything that's happening here. It records me typing into my meeting notes. And as I go along there, I can do extra things as well. Uh, I can also share my screens. I'll come back to share screens later on because 
It is really one of the most useful things in all of this meeting technology world. So what Share Screens does is it, as it explains, it allows you to just see what's going on in the meeting here. And if I look at this session here, you can see that it's now uh, showing me everything that's happening in my meeting. Obviously, if I show itself in this other meeting, then it just goes a bit crazy like that. So that's not really what I want to happen, but it allows all the viewers who are participating in the meeting to be able to see everything that I see. Uh, Share Screens is available in pretty much all of these applications. You also have some more advanced features within it. So uh, I can, for example, minimize it if I don't want to see that. And as I share it, I can also use a whiteboard. A lot of them, them have whiteboards like Zoom and WebEx also has a whiteboard as well there. And you can share just an application or you can share your desktop. If you want to have something that's playing on your computer, then the include system audio is good as well, if you tick that box. So I'm going to, right here, I'm going to stop the recording like that. And we'll see what happens with the recording in a little bit later on. So I'm going to end my Zoom meeting there. Click the hang up button. So this is a chat. What Teams does is it automatically makes this shared chat file with everyone who is in the meeting, which has the meeting notes built in. So everyone can see these and even edit them. And if there was a whiteboard, then it would save them here as well. And eventually the uh, recording will show up and pop up here. It's right now saying saving recording to Microsoft Stream. So a few things, it's not just the tech because there's a few things to uh, be aware of when you are doing meetings and preparing a meeting. Try and have a gen an agenda before you join the meeting and try and pre-create a location. Um, <laughs> just to say something that I experience, I can't tell you how often I have the meeting at my office or near my office if I just pre-suggest it at the beginning. <laughs> so my secret is I just say to someone, let's have a meet, they suggest let's have a meeting and I would say something like, how about we meet Friday at 10 a.m. at this cafe or at my office? Otherwise, let me know what works for you. And it sounds like a really silly thing, but I can't tell you how often that works because people don't want to make decisions. And that means I don't have to travel to everyone else's office to meet. <laughs> so I find that really, really useful to pre-suggest things and make it as explicit as possible. Suggest the date, time, and location, rather than what most people do, which is, oh, let's have a meeting. When are you free? How about next week? You end up having 15 different messages back and forth to just set up a meeting. Uh, lock it in, set it in the calendar, and your Google Calendar, your Outlook Calendar, whatever application you use, so that you then get reminded about it. And as I said before, try and keep meeting roles. Whether you're doing it as an online meeting or whether you're doing it as a face-to-face -face meeting, there still should be an understanding of who's going to be the people presenting, who's going to be the people who are leading the meeting, people who are listening in, maybe someone taking the notes, or uh, using the captions as I've shown you in Zoom as well. Some benefits of video calls over live meetings. So there is statistical data that shows that they can actually finish in roughly half the time time of a face-to-face -face meeting. And everyone can contribute given that you have this extra side chat window that you don't have to wait your turn to speak. Everyone can just kind of go into that and speak and, and say what they want to say and ask questions. And even if uh, people are not as fluent in the language or have different priorities, they can still all contribute in those kind of meetings. And it's also easier for the, for the presenter to actually distribute their materials. They can distribute a lot of things like images in the side chat that really adds to the experience that the participants have in the, in the meeting itself. All right. So, um, that's that one. Uh, the others are going to be, uh, kind of quicker ways of going through this because we've already covered a lot of the same applications. So looking at taking <laughs> photos or screenshots there. Now I find this fascinating, but most people are actually better at screenshotting with their phones than they are on screen, <laughs> on their computer screen. And that's because a lot of people just use the print screen command to take screenshots, but that's really not conducive to what it is. I'll show you what I do. 
What I do is I just press Windows key plus Shift plus S. And I do this probably about 50 times a day. I screenshot it and then that pastes it, that, that copies it. So then I can just sort of paste it and it's a screenshot here. I use this all the time. It's actually using a feature in Windows called Snip and Sketch. So if you go here and you go to Snip and Sketch, it's the same idea, but it's way more clicks to do it this way. So I just really like using the shortcut there. So it launches it here. You can edit it directly like you might be used to in a phone, but you can then copy it like I just showed you and paste it here. So yeah, highly recommend getting familiar with that. It's really, really useful application as you go along. Some advanced screen sharing options. So I did show you screen share in Teams. Uh, this is some cool stuff you can do in Zoom. So you can actually get Zoom to notify you if anyone has not uh, have this as their main window on their computer. <laughs> it actually has a pop-up of icons to show you that. You can also, with all of the Office apps, with, with all of the screen sharing apps, you can give control to other people and you can zoom in and out. So if you press the Windows key and the plus button, over there, it launches this magnifier that allows you to zoom in and out of any screen, not just PowerPoint, just whatever you're doing. So again, I use this all the time. It's very, very useful when I'm teaching my courses. All right, let's see what the panda has to say in channel-based chat. <laughs> it's an angry panda. I think he's annoyed that people are not working from home. <laughs> Today's data inputs. So. We are used to getting on a social and a professional basis, just things coming into our lives in all different ways. So I summarize these in two categories. I say it's either in boxes or in briefs <laughs> that they show up here, uh, whether it's a chat application or something that's more an email. The issue is the chat applications tend to be too light for what we really want to get done, but emails people consider to be very, very heavy. So what's good is to have something in the middle. Uh, and if we equate this to how things were about 25 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, people were saying that emails were too light, but then letters were a little bit too heavy. And a lot of people in business found it very difficult to transition to using emails for the day to day because they were so used to using letters and because they trusted that that was there. But I think that this is now making another transition. And I'm not the only one who thinks this way. Now here is an icon of WhatsApp and Outlook. And we have this new kind of application called channel-based chat. And this is where chat meets email. It's sort of Microsoft Teams and Slack are the best known for this, but there are other apps that I'll show you as well. And I'm not the only one that thinks this because this is a list of the companies who believe that email will die in about 10 years. It's Microsoft, it's Facebook, it's Google, because this is Google Hangouts, and it's Slack. Slack was the company that pioneered this sort of application, and they honestly believe that internal email is not going to be around anymore. So um, with these and with a lot of other kinds of applications, it's useful to use adoption through championing. So people can be using it and then tagging people in the applications and that will encourage people to reply. So let me show you uh, a quick demo of that. Over here. So I do have here um, an example of this is Google Hangouts. It allows you to create threads in channels. So you can have channels for things that you discuss uh, frequently and then you can create new threads as you go along. Slack, as I said, is the original one that started this. We have some channels. Some of them are disposable. For example, individual events that we run. This was uh, on the 6th of April. So we're going to close that and archive that. But some of them are, for example, coaching speakers. There is ongoing chats. Uh, you can have threads that follow quite nicely here. Uh, you can have reactions to messages and use a lot of Kind of, as I said, a hybrid of what we're used to using in social networking with uh, what we tend to do for other applications. These also integrate quite well with other software. For example, here is Doodle, which is a, an application I like to use as well. Uh, and then Microsoft Teams is 
how Microsoft look at it. You have different chats that you can have with individual people or here as teams. And you can just sort of start things and everything is automatically threaded. So here I can reply to threaded message. I can also at mention people inside my organization if they are equivalent to that. And then they will get notified that they have been mentioned about whatever is happening. So yeah, all of these allow this kind of app mentioning, which as I said, the championing instance, if you're a champion that really wants to push this forward, just start app mentioning people and then eventually they'll pick up and start replying to it. You even have features within Teams that allows you to share it between Outlook if you are using Outlook for email. You can even put in a CC to a Teams channel and then it gets sent to that channel. Cool. All right, so here we are back in the slides. As I said, Teams or channels can be either structural, which means that they continue going or they can be disposable for a one-off instance as well. I really like the use of both cases there. Now onto my next thing, which is Netflix for meetings. <laughs> So this is a concept that I like to explore and I like to explain, as does this cat. He likes to explore it as well. So 75% of workers today say they would rather watch than read different sources. And that comes to specifically to learning. Here's the source of that data point, but also just to absorb any other kind of information. So three out of four of them are about watching rather than reading. And this is why I call it Netflix for work. But then people have this question, well, if I don't want to, if I get bored and fall asleep in a meeting when it's live, why would I bother sitting through a video? And that is exactly why this needs to be on demand and this needs to be fully flexible compared to what we're used to. So um, I'm going to show you how we can do this. So uh, you can actually record your screen directly within PowerPoint application. If you go to insert, you have on the right this thing called screen recording. And here is the application I was using. I'm going to press record. It has the countdown there. This is built into PowerPoint 2013 or before. I can go to another thing and I can do any kind of action that I want there. And then when I'm done, I can just press stop. And often it would record my audio, but at the moment I'm using an Excel microphone, so it hasn't done that but I could set it if I wanted that to happen. Uh, as I have on this slide, there are some other third-party tools, Camtasia and Snagit. I really love these two, and they're free during coronavirus times. I'm actually making this video using Camtasia. Uh, and I have this screen to GIF. This is a free software that allows you to take a screen recording and convert it to a GIF and make lots of edits. I really, really enjoy it, actually. Um, so that's PowerPoint there. And as I showed you before on Teams, you can record a meeting in Teams and all of these other commonly used software also enables you to record meetings, which is really useful. Uh, so uh, yeah, I did talk about uh, what happens with the meeting later on. So let me go back to the chat window. So it says now the recording is ready and I can click on that and I can play it. It actually uses a service called Microsoft Stream, which is very similar to a YouTube for your organization. So I can press play there or I can open it on Microsoft Stream as well. And I'm going to show you one that I've recorded on Microsoft Stream for another webinar that I did recently. So this is uh, what it does. And it, even if I didn't use subtitles, it automatically transcribes the entire thing, which is fantastic. So I could search for, for example, uh, chat. And here is all of the instances where I've said that word. And I can click on there. And now it is playing that and uses the uh, speaker system as well usually, except I'm plugged into a separate system. But it would be uh, playing that as I went along. So it goes back to just before I said that in the video and does a fantastic job of picking it up. So this is something that you can imagine that you can combine your meeting recording and make that into a very short thing that people actually have to look for. You could just search for your name and then see which instances are applicable to your name. Uh, this application also picks up people's faces. So if you use this, 
for a video that records people's faces, it can pick up who's saying what, and you can add quizzes using interactivity. So Microsoft Stream is built into Office 365, which a lot of organizations currently have. Um, it is in the lowest package version, which as I said, is also available for free for six months during coronavirus times. In fact, uh, I have this, uh, this list of all of the applications that are free during coronavirus times, what they do and quick links for how to access them. So I talk about Slack, I talk about um, what they do for NGOs or is it for everyone, Google is doing stuff, uh, Camtasia, Citrix, WebEx, uh, Microsoft Office, Zoho Suite, all the big players are offering free things and I explain more about it here if you're interested to learn there. But I really love how we can continue to use this for further features. This other application, BlueJeans, it's not used as much, but this actually has a feature that can uh, take a recording of your meeting and then send someone a five minute highlights reel. So it uses AI to identify what the five minutes of highlights are and send that to someone in an email, which is pretty cool. Uh, so I have ideas that video is gonna be used way more. So let's say, for example, someone is reviewing a pie chart like this. I think that eventually you can put in these videos embedded. Storage is nowadays getting so cheap that we can really hold a lot of videos um, on the cloud. So people will be able to press play and explain why we have 6% here or why they have it elsewhere. Also in comments, let's say you're working with your coworker and you've decided to make this change. Have a video where you explain exactly why you've made that change. Um, have a video here where you explain why you might be looking at something else as well. So those are some ideas, but I think video is gonna, an on-demand video is gonna become more and more and more and more prominent as we go into uh, the situation in the future. Final thing is uh, these boards here, Kanban boards. This is a quick demo here. You might have heard of something called Trello, or you might have Microsoft Planner. Microsoft Planner and Trello are very, very similar. I'm gonna show you Planner because this comes in with Microsoft tenants. So what you do is you can get tasks that are assigned by bucket. So you can create different buckets or add a new task here. Pretty simple. You can just add it there very quickly or you can assign it to people or enter other details within it. For example, notes, start dates, end dates, a checklist, uh, any comments that you have, assign it to, is it in progress, or how urgent is it, a few other things there. But what's really cool about this is you can change how it's grouped. So I can say that I want to put it by assign to, and this is my colleague here, I can just drag something from one person into the other, and then he'll get notified that this is now in the task that he wants to do. I can see it, for example, by progress, and again, these are complete, but if I want to backtrack that, that it's not complete, I can just drag these in between all of these different group by features. You can see data in charts. So what's the status by how many are late if the deadline hasn't been reached, um, by the buckets and what the priority is, etc. cetera. I, I personally don't find this that useful. The schedule view I find quite useful. Here, if you use the deadlines feature, you could see how it fits into the calendar. And you can, in a lot of instances, also just export this to Excel. Uh, as I said, Microsoft Teams and Slack, all of these integrate very well with other applications. So the main way that I use this planner application is by adding a different board on here. Uh, some features here. This is a planner that I've added where I can just do things and interact with the software just like I could if I was in the application itself, but just through the user interface of Microsoft Teams. They also have this really good searchability feature as well. All right, and that takes us to the end of the presentation. So it takes us to the finish line. Let's see who's gonna make it this time. Oh, wow, <laughs> didn't see that one coming. Cool, so just to summarize, I've talked about threaded chats, and that's what's really useful about channel-based chat applications. Screen sharing, if you're not already using screen sharing all the time with your colleagues, even Skype it's built into as well, so highly recommend you use that. Um, files on demand, 
So ways that you can share documents through OneDrive or Google Drive, etc. And I showed you how you can transcribe meetings with a lot of the modern day software application and that enables you to search for things. So if you need uh, help on remote working software features, then here's my YouTube channel. As I said, I publish a lot of videos on there. This is a QR code that you can scan if you want to get into that YouTube channel. And finally, you can, uh, if you have any questions on this stuff, feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, I'm happy to answer some questions for free. And just to reiterate, all of these applications are free during COVID-19. And there is a further list on my website. I know what you're thinking. That was way too fast. Those demos were really, really good. And that is exactly why Netflix for meetings is the future. People want to be able to backtrack and view things on demand like you would with TV shows or YouTube or other things like that. We made this available via YouTube, so please feel free to rewatch that in your own time. All right, thank you very much for that. Thank you for watching. I hope you found that useful. Okay, so David, thank you very much for that tour de force on um, remote working software. I think uh, anybody who saw that could uh, see there is a wealth of apps out there, but that it may be difficult to understand which one is the correct one for, for them to use. I know for me, I'd under heard of a few of these before, but many of them I had not. So uh, for, for myself and for those on the audience, my question would be, for somebody who's never used this software before um, and is just wanting to learn a bit more about it, which, of, what, which is the easiest of these softwares, uh, these, uh, these apps to use and to get used to? So yeah, good question. Um, I would say that we have had like Zoom be the everyone's app of choice because that is really the one with the probably most user friendly, just pick up, plug and play, and pretty much anyone can use it. And you can just sort of understand how it works, at least the, the most basic features of it. Um, however, I'd say that uh, Microsoft Teams in terms of calling is pretty similar. It's just that it does other things. Um, so yeah, I'd say that most of the modern ones are not particularly difficult. Google is also pretty simple. The ones to avoid actually are the, the softwares that have been around for a long time because they kind of have a user interface that is a little bit uh, dated. And I, I, I've tried, for example, Citrix WebEx. I found that quite difficult to use. Um, but yeah, Microsoft Planner and Trello, I find really easy to use as well that I showed. Um, Microsoft Stream to be able to search transcribe meetings. That is super easy. You just click a link and then you have a search bar right there for you to check it out. So yeah, uh, a lot of them are um, quite simple, but I know that I've covered a lot in a short space of time. So it's a good thing it's in a video because you can go back and replay <laughs> as you need to. Yes, indeed. I think you've uh, demonstrated evidence for the uh, the need for the Netflix for, for meetings and the <laughs> Netflix for webinars as well. Um, okay then, so uh, a bit worrying that even the, of this new technology, the ones that have been around for a few years are, are already getting difficult to use relative to the newer ones. Um, but my next question would be related to uh, organizations themselves. So a number of organizations will, have be, will be getting used to this new technology. They've never used it before, or if they uh, have used it, they haven't used it to their full capacity. So uh, the next question would be for the, um, for the members, for the participants on the call, how can they as organizations decide uh, which of these is most suitable for their organization and their staff? Uh, which of these applications? Yeah, that, so that's a really good question. Um, my number one tip of all of these things, uh, my number one tip to answer that question is find out first and foremost what your organization already has access to. Uh, almost every business nowadays is using either Microsoft or Google infrastructure, uh, the paid versions like G Suite or Office 365. They already have these applications. Google has Hangouts, Microsoft has Teams and Planner and, and all other kind of ancillary things. So my advice would be don't really look outside of the organization for apps like Zoom and Slack are all very nice and good, but A, you have to actually pay for them more than you're already paying. And secondly, 
again, it's this idea that it's not all contained within the same place, which is what kind of works well with uh, the broad packages. Okay, okay. So go for the ones that you're already, the organization is already paying for. Yeah, pretty much. And, and just find out what your organization is paying for. I know so many organizations that have bought a Zoom license in the past two weeks, when they have Microsoft Teams, they've just never clicked on the button to figure out what it does. Uh, so yeah, it, it's kind of, it's an unfortunate way to be wasting money, to be honest, for an organization. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah I can, and I can certainly see from, um, with organizations quite new to some of this software, how they could fall into some of these, these traps. Yeah, they do trap you with, uh, for example, Zoom is giving you 40 minutes for free. Um, and then they, they're like, oh, well, you want more than 40 minutes? Then I guess you have to pay. So yeah, they, they have this freemium thing. So that's something to be a trap to be aware of. <laughs> okay, perfect. thank you for the tip. Okay then, um, one uh, elephant in the room that cannot be missed is the COVID-19 outbreak and the impact that will have on businesses and these type of applications. So. I mean, I know for a fact even Eurochem itself is trying to get used to using more of these softwares, but these, these applications, but it's not been easy. So my question to you would be, what do you think would be the longer term impacts of the COVID-19 outbreak on the use of this app, these, uh, these applications? Do you think it will continue? Do you think this is a trend that will, 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 will further um, expand? Or do you think that after uh, the COVID-19 outbreak um, returns to normal, um, organizations will simply go back to the software and, si and um, systems that they've already been used to? Yeah, so really good question. I'm actually going to uh, kind of break that down into two. The first one being, how are organizations going to adapt during COVID-19? And then I'll answer what I think might happen after COVID-19. So during COVID-19, um, of course, it's a it's a, it's a terrible issue that's facing the world right now. And uh, it's, it's just something that businesses have had to overnight just completely transform the way they work. And um, this is very atypical for businesses because they are generally very slow to adopt new technology. I gave examples earlier on in the slides about people using Skype and, and chat applications in business just because they were using them as consumers and businesses weren't fast enough to pick that up. So now we have the opposite happening. Businesses have to, for the sake of the health of their employees and their customers and, the, and everyone involved, they have to adopt something now. And so that's why I think that they are going to be uh, start using these apps. And for example, I know that Microsoft Teams has had a 775% increase on its usage <laughs> since coronavirus started in the countries that are practicing self-isolation. So this is happening across the board with Google and with, with Zoom and Slack and other platforms as well. So yeah, that, that is something that people need to do and businesses should really come up with policies of ways to keep this. So again, look for the applications you already have and immediately start people working on those. If you don't say on day one, we use, we have Google infrastructure, use Google Hangouts, then people will download and start using Zoom. And then in three days time, they'll be like, oh, can we buy Zoom? And then they've already got 17 meetings set up in Zoom and they're kind of very invested in it. So as your organization, just try to act quickly in terms of uh, creating policy and also use the newest applications. Skype for Business is a feature that a lot of organizations still use today. However, it has been discontinued by Microsoft actually. And next year they're completely retiring it because they've superseded it with Teams. So, you know, try and use the newest technology because that's going to be the one that works the best uh, and is able to weather the changes the best as well over time. Uh, next question, which was about the future. Um, I think I think a lot of things will go uh, will go back to how it was. Um, hopefully, we'll get to that stage in the not too distant future. But I think that some things are a permanent change, and that is remote working technology. I think businesses are going to more and more have people working from home or working from from somewhere else, 
and they're able to understand that we can withstand this and we can still have successful meetings and successful collaboration in documents even though people are in different places. So I think that it is really important for people to start learning these applications for that reason. Okay, okay. So it's, uh, it's really a case of um, if you don't use these technologies, um, you'll lose the knowledge of them um, and you could, you could risk falling behind later on in the future when they, they really take, uh, take on. Yes, I, I believe so, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so I guess uh, following on from that then, um, I know uh, we ourselves have experienced uh, some of the issues with the increased demand for these technologies um, in, this, uh, in this period of the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, people, uh, all of these technologies will be facing user rates that uh, they would have maybe never used uh, or never experienced before. So um, my question is, are, are these software, if, are these applications, are these technologies ready for really widespread use? Um, and I suppose what are the risks of using these, of the, the risks of using these software, the, the software applications at the moment? So, that, so that's a really good question. I think that um, these applications have just become uh, so, so, so used by everyone. As I, I gave the statistic about Microsoft Teams, I think Zoom's in uptake is much, much, much higher that's happened here. Like most people in the world didn't recognize it and now Zoom are cocky enough to require you to sign in if you want to join any meeting uh, because they just assume that everyone has it. And, you know, like we see it being used in uh, social media. We see it, you know, like I, I, I have a friend of a friend who had like a wedding that was broadcast on Zoom because uh, it was done in social isolation, but he wanted to share it with his friends. And it's just being used all the time, socially and professionally. So uh, were these companies ready? No, a lot of them were not. Um, unfortunately, as we know in the case with coronavirus, many, many businesses, just pretty much no one expected this was going to happen. And organizations in every sector are not ready. Um, I think with these kind of applications, it's, it's no different. I think they were, they were ready for this to be what they were expecting, but bandwidth within systems, internet speeds, uh, computer processor speeds uh, are definitely a factor. Um, what I would say is try and go with, with brand names and also just use good practice. So switch off your video if you are having issues um, mute your microphone in certain instances if you're not going to contribute to it and don't if you are having issues maybe don't try too much and something that I just thought of which uh, I haven't tested this but maybe a time zone is a, is a factor as well so for example if you're in Australia then try and do your meetings <laughs> before the rest of the world wakes up and then uh, you're, you're less likely to run into issues I think that's, uh, that's very good advice. Um, okay then, um, as the final question, I would just want to know, uh, David, what is your top number one tip for remote meetings? I would say the top one is use screen share. I can't tell you how much I love this feature and whenever I meet non-IT people, they don't use it. And I, I just know that pretty much every situation is better with screen share. Okay. <laughs> So if you are going to learn something, learn how to share your screen. As I said, it's even available in the consumer applications like Skype as well. Okay, I know that's uh, something I certainly want to try and uh, uh, get a bit more used to. Okay, um, well everybody, that brings an end to the Q&A session and an end to this webinar. Uh, I wanted to say thank you very much to David for spending the time to come to Eurocham uh, to take part in this webinar today. Thank you very much to the production team, Guillaume Maltevin and Champavatesov for taking part in making this uh, webinar happen. And uh, thank you participants uh, for listening in. Um, so from the Eurocham team, thank you very much. Yes, and if you have any, uh, any further questions, feel free to leave some comments uh, underneath the video as well, and we can uh, get back to you answering those questions. From, uh, from Tom and David, uh, the Eurocham webinar, uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.